Uh, today's lecture is of a slightly different nature than what we have seen uh, uh, previously. We were centered, let us say, on the nature of Indian civilization, its contributions, its uh, explorations. Uh, but, uh, and we saw, among other things, the ethical system that governed or tried to govern uh, Indian civilization and its manifestations in actual practice. Now we are exploring a very different uh, value system today, which is that of the uh, British colonial uh, rule. And um, the, the difference is going to be striking, in fact, because as this is a forgotten chapter of Indian history, I mean, uh, our uh, history students, I'm sure, learn very little about this, maybe two or three sentences, one paragraph at the most. I don't know, we will ask you later. Um, I thought that uh, this was important to highlight. In fact, it is not in initially my inspiration. When I was visiting IIT Campo three years ago, one professor here specifically asked me, could you give a lecture on this topic? That was three years ago, and then I did have a lot of material, but there was no time. So I said, well, I'll do it someday, and I'm glad that I could keep my promise. Um, this is not a very pleasant chapter, of course, of Indian history. The British presence in India has had many kinds of different effects and sometimes very conflicting, almost opposite. So I'm not trying to reduce the whole of uh, uh, British Raj to what I'm going to show. Uh, it is much broader than this, but at the same time, we have to concentrate on this aspect because it is so neglected. Um, there will be uh, a few quotations that need to be read, so I hope you will not uh, mind uh, going through those important statements by different statesmen, different historians. Uh, <clears throat> I, am, I have divided somewhat artificially my presentation into two parts. One has to do with the immediate financial manifestation of the British presence, <coughs> which is very well documented. <coughs> and the second will be concerned with the uh, effect on the society, the, the human cost of the British presence, right up to the very end <coughs> of the British Raj. So when we begin, well, we can begin conveniently at um, uh, Robert Clive's conquest of Bengal, uh, in 1757, and uh, <clears throat> this is of course a convenient landmark. This is going to mark a whole uh, uh, accelerating development of the British conquest of India. But then what did, how did the British, the early British, uh, leaving aside of course some even older travelers uh, to, to India, British, French, Dutch and so on, uh, how did they find India in the 18th century. In fact, we have uh, a lot of testimonies of uh, um, uh, travelers from various nations. And one thing that they are unanim unanimous about is the fact that in the 18th century, India is economically flourishing. And this is one word which comes back again and again in many of the testimonies to the point that we have a magnificent anthology in French, unfortunately not translated yet into English, of French travelers into India in the 18th century, the same period, and the title of it is Flourishing India, because Les Indes Florissantes, because uh, this, is, this is how they, fi they find a rich country with a, a, th a thriving economy, thriving production, thriving exports, and uh, basically uh, widespread prosperity. So this is confirmed by Clive's um, description of Bengal, uh, the, his knowledge is limited to Bengal, where he says that um, uh, this is one of the richest parts of the world, and he calls it the paradise of the earth. But then he had chosen to do something uh, with this paradise, which, of, well, to, to give you a few facts and figures, uh, we know that Bengal exported rice to Sri Lanka, to the Maldives, sugar to Arabia, Mesopotamia, silks to Europe, and among many other pro products that were shipped out of Bengal in those days, you can uh, list opium, varnish, wax, musk, spices, 
preserved fruits, ghee, and other things. So these are the, the documented uh, expounds. Uh, it's interesting because, you know, in, in older periods, we don't have such precise records. And in fact, these are things that do not always uh, leave traces in the archaeological record in particular. But then uh, Clive, when he had uh, Bengal under his thumb, started to plunder it. And uh, this will become famous in uh, historical accounts as the Bengal plunder. This is a phrase that comes back again and again in history books. And the, he extracted taxes at the rate of two million pounds a year, which is, of course, a colossal amount in those days, because this is the pound of those days, not of today. Within five years, <coughs> Bengal was reduced to extreme poverty. And in addition, and we'll see that, unfortunately, this tends to be a pattern. At the same time, the, the Bengal was struck by a severe drought, yet the East Indian Company uh, which had been recently set up, um, uh, urged rigor in tax collection. Rigor means uh, militarily imposed tax collection, uh, which never reduced. And you see, this is one major difference with the uh, previous uh, uh, Muslim rule, which was that though it was severe, in fact, there are two major differences. Let me spell them out right away. Uh, the Muslim rule was severe also in tax uh, extraction but it still had to modulate itself according to the circumstances. And um, uh, when there were severe famines like this, the uh, taxes would be either reduced or suspended. Uh, secondly, one reason why India still managed to, be, to have this flourishing economy before the British came is that the, uh, under the Mughal rule, not under the previous preceding uh, Islamic rules like the Sultanate period, that was a totally different uh, context. But under the Mughal rule, the wealth which was, there was plunder, there was extraction, massive extraction of wealth, but it was actually reinvested uh, in the land. It was reinvested within India. It was not drained out of India. So, so this is what uh, Clive initiated. And by 1968, please note the speed of the Phenomenon, this is uh, uh, 57, and by 1968, Bengal exported, within quotation marks, because these are not real exports, 10 times more goods and cash than it imported. And uh, I quote from a parliamentary committee of those days, numerous fleets of large ships loaded with the most precious commodities from the East annually arrived in England in a constant and increasing succession. But this was not trade as the British there thought it was. It was simply uh, a tribute in the uh, words of this parliamentary committee. That is to say, it's a euphemism for plunder. In fact, at the same time, 1778, we have a very interesting and moving testimony by uh, the French orientalist, uh, Anquetil du Perron, who was in India for decades um, hunting for the Vedas. He wanted to publish to be the first to publish the Veda in, in, uh, in Europe and uh, to get manuscripts of the Veda. He didn't know and nobody knew that the, the, all the manuscripts of the Veda were lying in the, in the Royal National Library in Paris since uh, the 1730s, so for the last 40 years or so, because they had been collected by Jesuits, but nobody could read Sanskrit. So that's another story. Anyway. Uh, he was the first to publish, incidentally, uh, um, uh, European translation, uh, Latin translation of the Upanishads, uh, uh, compilation of the Upanishads, which interestingly had been first translated from Sanskrit into Persian by uh, Dharashuko, the brother of Aurangzeb. So it's interesting to see, you know, the evolution. We have Upanishads from Sanskrit into Persian. Uh, Anctil du Perron translates them from Persian into Latin. And these are going to be read all over uh, Europe by Schopenhauer, for example. Anyhow, let me come back to this. And he writes because he's a witness to this plunder and this very rapid impoverishment of India, in particular Bengal to start with. And he says, peaceful Indians, did the rumor of your riches have to penetrate a climb in which artificial needs know no bounds? He's, of course, talking about Europe. He says, soon new foreigners reach your shores. Inconvenient guests, everything they touch belongs to them. 
It was not enough that they should invade your commerce, make the price of foodstuffs, foodstuffs and goods triple, alter their quality. Your factory is almost wiped out. We'll come back to this point a little later. The workers taking refuge in the mountains, a dying son asking his father what harm he did those foreigners who have taken the bread out of his mouth, nothing touches or softens their hearts. Your goal, the Peruvians and Mexicans were told, here by, by the Spanish in particular, here the revenue of, Hin of Hindustan is what we demand, even if for that streams of blood have to flow. So we're going to see, in fact, and I'm going to use mostly such testimonies from Europeans, because then, of course, uh, then of course, you know, the genuineness of these testimonies cannot be challenged. Another, and, and now I'm turning to a few British um, uh, scholars, statesmen, <coughs> journalists, sometimes politicians, because we should not imagine that all the all British people were actually colonialists. In fact, some were openly anti-colonial. And they opposed the, the exploitation that Britain imposed upon large parts of the world. So they were, of course, uh, ridiculed, demonized, sometimes even persecuted in Britain. They were a, a much minority opinion. But when Warren, Warren as Hastings, who succeeded Clive, um, uh, uh, and who was the first governor general of Bengal, uh, when there was a trial uh, for impeachment because he had enriched himself colossally, enormously, uh, partly, you know, generously helping himself out of this Bengal plunder. And uh, there was, a, a, in Britain, he was uh, arrested and tried for, uh, for, for this. And uh, in fact, uh, we find uh, Richard Sheridan, a well-known playwright and politician in those days, testifying against him. Uh, in fact, Warren Hastings will be acquitted uh, and he will be allowed to enjoy his ill-gotten wealth uh, peacefully. But this is Sheridan's speech, much, much shortened. It's a very long, very eloquent speech in, uh, you know, f this kind of uh, 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 flourishing, uh, uh, um, florid, I should say, 18th century English. He says, if a stranger had, at this time, he's referring to 1782, Gone into the kingdom of Ud, this is here, by the way, this is uh, uh, Ayodhya kingdom in those days. Um, observing the wide and general devastation and all the horrors of the scene of plains unclothed and brown, of vegetation burnt up and extinguished, of villages depopulated and in ruin, of temples unroofed and perishing, of reservoirs broken and dry, we see in fact, interestingly, testimony of the breakdown of water structures, he would naturally inquire, this innocent stranger would inquire, what war has thus laid waste the fertile fields of this once beautiful and opulent country? What civil dissensions have happened thus to tear asunder and separate the happy societies that once possessed those villages? What severe visitation of providence has thus dried up the mountains and taken from the face of the earth every vestige of green? Or oh, rather, what monsters had crawled over the country, tainting and poisoning what the voracious appetite could not devour? To such questions, what must be the answer? And then he answers. Sheridan gives the answer to this traveler. And he says, no wars have ravaged these lands and depopulated these villages. No civil discords have been felt. No religious rage, no merciless enemy, no affliction of providence, which, while it's scourged, for the moment, cut off the sources of resuscitation. No voracious and poisonous monsters, no. All this has been accomplished by the friendship, generosity, and kindness of the English nation. Now, this is a British man speaking. They had embraced us with their protecting arms, and lo, these are the fruits of their alliance. Uh, we, much more recently, and I am going to read this quote by uh, P.S. Brendan, who has uh, uh, authored a few years ago a masterpiece on the Greek decline and fall of the British Empire. So this is 2008. And it's important to, you know, to see the, the, the first testi testimonies and these more recent uh, uh, essays because in between there have been scholars who have tried to sanitize or lessen this impact of the, the, the let us say, this dark side of the British rule. 
and to, to say that maybe it was not so bad after all. We'll come back to this argument a little later. But uh, uh, P.S. Brandon writes, Bengal was bled white. In, by, in 1765, its people were provoked into a desperate revolt, which ultimately enhanced the company's power through the acquisition of a crucial tax collecting right from the Mughal emperor. But here he uh, does not mention that this uh, tax policy will be far more ruthless uh, uh, when conducted by the British. Indian revenues, which perhaps amounted to a billion pounds sterling between Plassey and Waterloo, spelled the redemption of Britain, said the Earl of Chatham. That is to say, because of this revenue extracted from uh, uh, India, um, British economy could be reborn. They were a kind of gift from heaven. But in 1769 and 70, Bengal descended into a hell of dearth. Millions died of hunger. I'm coming back to this in the second part of my talk. And some were driven to cannibalism. The famine wiped out a third of the population. They're unburied corpses sating the appetites of vultures, jackals, and alligators. Yet through relief efforts, though relief efforts were made, British, and he quotes some other source, bullies, cheats, and swindlers continue to prey upon the carcass of Bengal. So you can see that then as well as now, we have uh, British people who have no, uh, you know, who do not use euphemisms to characterize this aspect of the British rule. Now, there's another <coughs> financial, there are many other financial aspects involved. One, which con one consisted in opening what the British called the, the Indian ledger. You see, the British had the British Raj. And it's not as if the Indian, the, 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 the financial burden of uh, civilizing India, that is to say to, to exploit India, um, uh, this uh, economy, Indian economy, was not f merged ever with Britain's economy. It was kept at a, as a separate account. So that, that was known as the Indian ledger. And in a ledger, as you know, you have a debit and a credit columns. And in the debit column, the British would conveniently end, enter once in a while what they call debts. So for instance, when the mutiny, so-called Sepoy mutiny, uh, as you know, of uh, 1857 broke, up, broke out, the British had to uh, import soldiers all the way from Britain because they could no longer depend, of course, on the Indian soldiers. So they brought 50,000 British soldiers who, of course, exacted very uh, systematic revenge, but that's another story. And they entered into that ledger in the debit column a charge of 50 million pounds. Uh, which to their estimate was the cost of importing those soldiers. And what, did they, what does it mean in, pra in practice? When you enter this debt, it simply means that revenues from India will have to reimburse that debt. This is what it means. Uh, another example, <coughs> which I'll not explain in detail today, is the famous Indian Railway. You know, we are told uh, that uh, the British did uh, several very good things in India. For example, they developed the railways. Very true. But then there is a kind of implied uh, understanding that this railway was a kind of philanthropic act to develop India. The railways served two main purposes for which the, the British desperately needed this uh, fast means of communication in India. The first was to be able to move troops about very fast and control mutinies or expand also their uh, conquest of India to the last uh, remaining uh, regions. The second purpose we're going to see a little later. I'll tell you what it is. So, but then, after building this railway, the British again entered in the debit column what was known as the railway debt. And uh, debts invite interest. So it was not only the debt that was entered in the debit column, but until the debt was refunded, somehow uh, it had to, be, it had to uh, carry interest also. Now we move to Brooke Adams, a well-known in his days, very famous American historian who was a rare critic of capitalism and who published a famous essay in 1895 which was called uh, The Law of Civilization and Decay. 
uh, the, the, the main theme of Isaiah says is that all civilizations have cycles of rise and fall, and uh, uh, they cannot uh, they, they cannot remain forever. They have some inherent uh, law of decay which will cause them to fall eventually. So well, so far this has been true of almost all civilizations, but let us not go into that. His testimony is interesting because he wrote that Britain's industrial revolution, which in fact begins in uh, 1760 or thereabouts, you know the famous uh, uh, development of the steam engine, which then spurred a lot of industrialization of Britain and, uh, and you know, it had ripple effects throughout Europe. This um, it could not have taken place without the famous uh, Bengal plunder that followed the, the conquest of Bengal. And he writes, very soon after Plassey, the Bengal plunder began to arrive in London and the effect appears to have been instantaneous for all authorities agree that the industrial revolution began within with the year 1760 possibly since the world began no investment has ever yielded the profit reaped from the indian plunder so this is an interesting view by an american economist that in fact it is india which financed the industrial revolution and not europe's own wealth well this has to be uh, tested again, uh, you know, by modern economists, but there was wide agreement about this in, in those days. Another important voice of those uh, days is that of William Digby. He was a, a journalist, an author, and he came and spent many years in India. He wrote several essays. One of them, the, the, the first was uh, the famine campaign in southern India, Madras, and Bombay presidencies and province of Mysore, 1876-78. Uh, and uh, <coughs> this was, uh, um, <coughs> in fact, about a famine that we're going to uh, study a little later. In 91, he published an open letter. This is the title of his letter. An open letter to the members of the House of Commons on the dark side of British rule in India. So I've borrowed <coughs> this phrase from him, in fact. A side so dark as to make it doubtful if British rule has been or is a blessing to the masses of India. So the title of his open letter carries uh, the whole message of it. I don't have to be more explicit. But then in 1901, he finally wrote a massive book, which luckily now is available uh, on the internet. <coughs> and this book is called Prosperous with quotation marks in the title. That is to say, there is an irony implied. Prosperous British India, because certain uh, British rulers were claiming that they were spreading prosperity, a revelation from official records. And this was a detailed analysis of all British official records. He was not using any other source than the very uh, own records of the British Raj to show how uh, British was ruining, had ruined India. And uh, in fact, uh, one of his remarks at the start of his book was, time was not more distant than a century and a half ago, when Bengal was much more wealthy than was Britain. So there was a kind of unanimity among all these voices. And uh, I'm mentioning this work because it had a tremendous historical impact on the uh, freedom movement in India. In fact, we will see very soon Indian voices echoing uh, Digby's uh, uh, study. Um, he was one of those books, I mean, this book of his was one of those that had the greatest impact uh, among Indian freedom fighters. In those days, people like uh, Tilak in Maharashtra, people like uh, Sri Aurobindo, Bipin Pal, and many others in Bengal uh, actually avidly read Digby's book and, uh, you know, started digesting it and spreading it uh, through many uh, means and channels. So this was a very influential study. <coughs> in fact, I'm now coming to the Indian voices. You have recognized, I'm sure, Dadabhai Nauroji, the grand old man of India, who was the first Indian uh, MP in the House of Commons in, in Britain. And he was extremely loyal to the British rule. He was uh, full of admiration for the better qualities of the British, and he was convinced that you know the British could do a lot of good to India, uh, 
But then after looking at the facts in detail and the figures, he was obliged to nevertheless uh, author a big uh, volume that also is available and has been reprinted all the time by the Indian government uh, called Poverty and Un-British Rule in India. One un-British because his whole argument was that the, the kind of uh, cruelty and uh, severe uh, exploitation by the British rule was uh, against, was contrary to the generous temperament of the British. So I can, that's a matter of opinion. I'm not going to express an opinion on this. But he, he, there was a lot of hard data uh, in his book, a lot of tables and facts and figures, and all of it taken either from Digby's own book or from the same British um, records. And in fact, this is what convinced him to join, though in a fairly moderate manner, the, the uh, freedom movement. And uh, when uh, the Indian National Congress in 1906 had its uh, national session in Calcutta, uh, he was uh, persuaded by the Bengali freedom fighters in particular to, uh, to declare that Swaraj should be the goal of this movement. Now, they deliberately left Swaraj undefined uh, in those days, but uh, he was the first, in fact, Indian to openly declare that goal. The second great figure in this, uh, uh, you know, <coughs> exposition of the, of the impact of the British rule is somebody whom, unfortunately, you're not going to recognize, or very few of you, maybe a few Bengali friends here. He's one of our, you know, many forgotten great Indians. He's Ramesh Chandra Dutt, who was a very prolific writer. He wrote books on Indian civilization. He wrote abridgments of Mahabharata, Ramayana. He wrote, he wrote actually tens of books. Uh, he was. I believe the very first ICS, Indian ICS uh, officer, if I remember correctly, the very first. Uh, he was a historian. He was the Diwan of uh, the Maharaja Gaikwar of Baroda. And he authored in 1902-1904 two big volumes uh, no, uh, titled The Economic History of India, uh, which were exactly along similar themes, but far more detailed than the Dabai Nauruji's study. So these are basically the three major books, Digby's and uh, these two, which, without which, in fact, the freedom movement, which you know, kind of exploded at the time of the uh, partition of Bengal in 1905, might not have uh, uh, risen in such a powerful manner. Because by now, this, uh, uh, you know, the, the, all these facts had spread, and they had been translated into many Indian languages. These are, for example, the figures compiled by Dadabhai Nauruji, where you see the drain, the amount of wealth extracted from India, sent to Britain, often as uh, an excuse for refunding the Indian debt. And you can see the periods, five-year periods here, in, in which he has uh, tabulated it all. So if you add uh, over 38 years, just in 38 years, 200 million pounds are shipped to India. And <laughs> they were, they were uh, <coughs> shipped either as a uh, refund of uh, de uh, these debts, which I've explained earlier. So it could be the railway debt. It could be levies for wars, because India had to finance its own wars. For example, when the British were fighting uh, either colonial powers in India, say the French, uh, in, in, in or around Pondicherry, or when they were fighting wars in Afghanistan. All this was to be funded from India. It was not to be funded from Britain. So these, is, these were called the levies for war, etc. So this is the kind of uh, uh, facts and figures that uh, Dadabai Nauruji uh, spread. <clears throat> and in fact, the Briti some, most of the British rulers had made no bones about it. For example, we have Lord Salisbury, then Secretary of State for India, and later on Prime Minister of India uh, on several terms, who wrote in uh, 1878, in fact, it was addressed to the British cabinet. He wrote, if our ancestors, you know, because many people said, uh, you know, the, the, the British rule is beneficial, it is benevolent, benevolent, um, it is India's good fate, uh, 
Uh, and in fact, even the initial uh, so-called moderate members of the International Congress were also praising the benevolence of the British rule and so on. But uh, he said that, you know, if our ancestors, British ancestors, had cared for the rights of other people, the British Empire would not have been made. So let us not, uh, you know, be too sentimental about the British rule. <clears throat> and he said the whole thing is that, for him, the whole issue was, as India must be bled, the bleeding should be done judiciously. So his only concession was that, you know, uh, uh, let us not bleed to the point where we will not be able to bleed any, any longer. This is what he means. So, but then there's another voice that tried, and this is from a 1909 report <clears throat> that tried to, uh, you know, at portray the British, the, the financial impact in slightly more uh, beneficent terms. So this report, <coughs> which is a memorandum on the past 50 years of British rule in India, and it's addressed to the uh, British Parliament, says the debt of India on, in 1908 amounted to, uh, I will round off the figures, uh, 246 million pounds, of which 157 uh, millions was sterling debt and 88 rupee debt. Of this total, 177 mi million pounds have been incurred for railways. This is what I explained earlier. So we have now the figure that uh, the British spent on the railways, which was totally refunded by, by Indians at large. So it is not as if the British funded the, the Indian railway. It was Indians who funded the Indian railways and 30 million for irrigation works. The interest on this portion of the debt is charged to these particular services. This is what I explained earlier. And as they sh both show large net profits, but this is now in the 20th century, the public debt of uh, no charge for interest on this account falls on the taxpayer. But this was after the full refund had been effected. The public debt of India, apart from capital thus invested, is therefore only 38 million pounds, now we are in 1909, as again 51 million pounds before and 93 millions after the mutiny period, that is 1857, and the charge for interest falling on the revenues is quite inconsiderable. So this is trying to show that, after all, uh, it is a very manageable burden. But we are now in the 20th century. Now let us look at other aspects uh, uh, one other aspect of the financial impact is, of course, the destruction of India's native industries. That itself would require a full treatment. It's a very uh, interesting chapter, but I will just mention that uh, why was India flourishing, according to all these European travelers in the 18th century? Because it had a lot of industries. They were industries, but they were not industries in, by the definition of industry in the post industrial revolution era. But India was producing, and as I showed earlier, uh, you saw briefly those exports from Bengal, it was producing a lot of textile, a lot of iron and steel, which were exported out of India. And um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the way that the British could actually develop their economy was not only by extracting tax, but by importing their own goods into India and manipulating the exchange rates, the import duties, India's export duties, by making sure that British goods ended up being cheaper than Indian goods. So in fact, uh, initially the Indian goods were the ones that were cheaper and they were of much better quality. But because they were controlling the sea trade, they could ensure that uh, India's export were controlled and they were imposing also high um, uh, uh, export duties. It was another Brit Indian statesman, K. M. Munchi. Uh, you you would have heard his name. Uh, he was a well-known statesman after independence. Um, he was very close to Gandhi, though they had <coughs> several different important differences. But he was close to Gandhi during the freedom movement. And during the freedom movement, he wrote another book, which but it is a slim book, which is the ruin that Britain wrought where he concentrates especially on this aspect of the destruction of the native industries. In fact, there was a, a, a reaction at this level, and the reaction was the Swadeshi uh, 
and boycott movement, uh, which started with the Bengal partition of 1905, where finally, with all this information, you know, Indians realized that they, if they could not export anymore, if they could not um, develop their industries anymore, at least there was one thing they could do, which was to boycott Indian goods. Uh, there had been a few earlier voices in the 19th century, but somehow the, 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 this had not picked up a momentum. It is the Bengal partition which, uh, you know, created so much uh, furor in Bengal that uh, the, the time became ripe for, for this boycott movement and, in parallel, a Swadeshi movement. If, you know, uh, Indians were not to buy Indian, uh, uh, British textiles anymore, then they had to generate their own. So they restarted industries uh, in this uh, post-Bengal uh, 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 partition phase to meet the Indian needs. And then for the first time, and, and that did have an, um, uh, an impact, a negative impact on Britain's economy. And then for the first time, Indians realized that they were not totally helpless in the face of, um, of the, the, the British manipulations. So here you see, as an example, the uh, export of cotton from uh, uh, India in 1800 by the Parsi community, and uh, this is uh, this is being exported from uh, Bombay uh, to other places. If you look at the bottom line, if you look at the summary of all this data, this is a graph prepared by Mag Magus uh, Ad uh, Andis. Um, what is his name? I should have put his name. Andesan, Mag Magus Andesan, who was an uh, American economist who died a few years ago. And he actually prepared a book which is called uh, World Economy, The History of World Economy for the Past 2000 Years, something like that, where he compiled all possible known sources of world economy. For example, we have testimonies from the Chinese with facts and figures, some of which go many, many centuries. The Romans also were keeping very minute record, uh, records of their uh, interactions with various parts of uh, the, the, the world as it was then. I think I showed in an earlier lecture how they complained about the massive imports from <coughs> India and their limited exports to India. So this is what uh, Magus Anderson has compiled. And if 2,000 years ago, his estimate, I have put China in red and India in, in yellow. Um, his estimate is that China had about 27% uh, share of the world GDP, and India 33%. That's 2,000 years ago. So if you add, add up, you get 60% for just both of these. So Asia obviously was the epicenter of the world economy. I mean, Europe in those days is just nowhere at all. And you can see that uh, with a few ups and downs, something here up happens uh, suddenly. And this is uh, the downfall of <coughs> Indian economy, which uh, coincides with the colonial rule. For a little while, China benefits, because uh, uh, China is not yet fully colonized. And uh, then the, some of the you know, market is transferred to China. But then uh, China, in turn, succumbs to the colonial rule, and then you can see the graph. And uh, of course, in blue is UK, and you can see the, uh, how uh, the uh, uh, share of the world GDP multiplies many fold. It is, say, 3%, and it will peak at 9%. So it multiplies three times uh, at the height of the colonial era. So this is quite clear. Now, there's a second aspect to this uh, a dark chapter, as uh, William Digby calls it, of the British rule, which is the consequence of the uh, Indian populations. We've already heard um, one account, but let us see the facts and figures. Now, of course, these figures are approximate. And we are taking here kind of average figures between all the various estimates. Um, sometimes the, uh, the, the, uh, we do have facts from British records and reports of those days, especially there were various famine commissions, but uh, hist some historians are deferred and have taken larger figures. So <coughs> these are the figures. This is one of the most severe 
this is the one that was alluded to earlier, one third of Bengal population wiped out uh, in the last decades of the 18th century. So that's about 21 million deaths. Then you will see another very severe, 100 years later, almost exactly, very severe famine. And finally, one which is actually concentrated during uh, the Second World War for reasons which I'm going to explain very shortly. So this estimate of about 60 million deaths due to famine um, is a rough estimate. Some people say it might be only 40 millions, but anyway, we're not really concerned with the exact number, but with the magnitude of it. In fact, according to Mike Davis, who is an American historian who wrote a, a, a small and very important little book called Late Victorian Holocausts. This pattern is repeated in most of the British colonies uh, in other parts of the world. It is not limited to India. It is repeated in China. It is repeated, repeated in Brazil and in parts of Africa. So his estimate is that during this short period of uh, <coughs> 1870 to uh, 1914 First World War, his estimate is 15 million deaths worldwide as a result of the colonial policies, and especially the result of the ma market manipulations, about which I will spend a couple of minutes a little later, manipulation of markets. Um, but let us uh, note that not all of these victims died of hunger directly. Many actually died of the consequences because they were herded in various camps, uh, euphemistically uh, called famine relief camps. And uh, uh, th those camps were often depopulated through various epidemics. So for example, if you read the uh, uh, Bengal famine of 1770s, uh, William Hunter, <coughs> who was a well-known British historian in the 19th century, writes, while the country every year became a total waste, the English government constantly demanded an increased land tax. So you see with that we are on very secure ground uh, because these are all uh, British voices. All through the stifling summer of 1770, the people went on dying. The husband's men, the husband men, that is to say the farmers, sold their cattle, they sold their implements of agriculture, they devoured their seed grain, you know the grain that you store every year, to be able to sow the, 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 the next year's crop. They sold their sons and daughters till at length no buyer of children could be found. They ate the leaves of trees and the grass of the field. So this is the estimate we have seen. Uh, the surviving peasants were actually forced most of the time to sell their land or to give it up to usurers, uh, moneylenders, and at best they could become in turn low wage agricultural laborers. So this is one uh, rare photograph from the uh, 100 years later, uh, another famine which now was not confined to Bengal but was all India. Uh, this is the one we mentioned earlier. And uh, in fact, it is not as if this left uh, the British public unmoved. Uh, there were campaigns in Britain you know, to expose these facts, which the government was trying to conceal as best as it could. Uh, but uh, there, was, there were not only those uh, anti-imperialistic uh, voices whom I have mentioned earlier, but even some parts of the British press uh, tried to expose the facts. This is a <coughs> drawing sketch published in the Illustrated London News in 1877 at the height of this uh, uh, 19th century famine. Natives waiting for relief at Bangalore, but most of the time not getting it. This is distribution of relief in Bellary, uh, Madras Presidency. This is again in 1877. So you can see the scene with the British officials uh, distributing token amount of reliefs. But, and this is in fact also about in a magazine called The Graphic, uh, a photograph showing the, uh, the, the caption is uh, the last of the herd, this is the caption here, the last of the herd, and uh, where the, the farmer ultimately loses all his cattle. And you, can, you, you know very well that the farmer's wealth is you know, twofold. It is the land on the one hand, but it is also the cattle, the, 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 the goat herds, and so on. 
the livestock. Now, one factor which seriously compounded the situation and which should not be left untouched because here the British only had a partial role, the Indians had a big role, was lucrative speculation on grain. What happened was that merchants, traders, soon found that they could enrich themselves out of the situation. And uh, that uh, by <coughs> Uh, keeping hold of their stocks uh, during famines, they could wait till the, the price of grain had risen manifold. So this is, of course, the te technique of hoarding. And uh, for this, they would, they would hold their stocks. And, uh, but then how could they, you see, how could they manage to stock, their, to hold their stocks? You cannot, they, these were very, very colossal st stocks of grain at times. They found a very smart way of doing it, which was, that they would uh, hire good strains and they would simply keep the good strains moving about India. And much of the stock was actually kept in the good strains and thanks to the recently installed telegraph, they kept in touch with the markets here and there in other parts of India and they would find out where the grain uh, had reached the highest rate. And then they would direct their stock to that part. So that is why Gray, uh, regions which were actually not directly affected by scarcity or by famine, where there were still plentiful harvests, such as the Tanjavo belt in Tamil Nadu, ended up being as severely affected by famines as the rest. So Mike Davis, whom I quoted earlier, speaks of the personification of free market economics as a mask for colonial genocide. And here you have a picture uh, published by the same William Digby of grain destined for export, stacked at the beach in, at Madras. It's going to be uh, very shortly uh, uh, exported, while the rest of uh, India is, um, is uh, almost dying. In fact, you have here a chart prepared by Casey Ghosh in a book called Famines in Bengal, 1770-1943. And you, it's very interesting, this chart is important because you see in blue the exports of rice and you see in red the exports of wheat. And here you have, this is only in the 19th century, not 18th as, as we saw before. And you see the great famine striking here, 1874-75 uh, uh, until 78. Uh, and you can see here that the export of rice hardly diminishes. It is basically stable. But what happens is that the export of wheat increases because of this speculation which we have seen. So what was the British response? Well, we saw that there were a few relief camps, but the relief camps were, were really few, far between, and unable to really cope with the extent of the tragedy. In fact, the British were most of the time struggling to prevent Indians from entering, from reaching the relief camps. And we have reports, official reports, especially <coughs> in Maharashtra, of sepoys, that is to say the army, being employed to block roads to prevent the migration of people from rural uh, regions to the cities. Um, <coughs> even, even during those famines, the British were openly advocating the um, trade policy of laissez-faire. Laissez-faire, as you know, is the French phrase that means let, let, let live, let, uh, let go, literally, let do. So it is the, basically the philosophy of free market economy. When you allow the rates of commodities to reach their own free values. But actually, um, uh, uh, this is an excuse to allow speculation to rise and rise and certain people to enrich themselves. And uh, the Famine Commission of 1878-80, there were many Famine Commissions which uh, published big reports out of which many important data can be obtained, said the doctrine that in time of famine the poor are entitled to demand relief would probably lead to the doctrine that, entitled, that they are entitled to such relief at all times. So see what this is exactly saying is that it's dangerous to, uh, to have a doctrine that in time of famine people are entitled to demand relief because then they will demand relief at all times. So this is the kind of official uh, stand 
you know, which uh, prevented the, the, the spread of a real uh, a disaster relief policy. In fact, some went so far, some British officers went so far as to express the opinion that actually famine was good. Uh, here in an 1881 report, we have the opinion that if the government spent more of its revenue on famine relief, an even larger pro proportion of the population would become penurious. I hope you can follow the logic behind such a statement, you see, that uh, we will have many more poor if we uh, give relief uh, during famine periods. Uh, there were some notorious figures. I have to mention Lytton, the famous uh, uh, India's Nero, Viceroy of India during 1876 and 80. Uh, his uh, son-in-law was, uh, you know, Lutens, the architect of New Delhi. And he issued an order during his uh, rule that there is to be no interference of any kind on the part of the government with the object of reducing the price of food. So let the price of food escalate as much as it likes. In fact, during the Great Famine, which we have referred to many times, he organized an extravagant durba in uh, Delhi to proclaim Victoria the Empress of India. You know, previously she was not officially, it was the as you know, it was the East India, East India Company that uh, was ruling India. And finally, uh, it dissolved itself, transferred the whole of India to uh, uh, Victoria, who was um, proclaimed Empress of India. And during one week, at the height of this famine, he, had, he conducted a huge feast in Delhi for 68,000 officials, satraps, and maharajas. He was also uh, involved, but in a very catastrophic manner, in the Anglo-Afghan wars, uh, the, the, all these wars were lost by the British, but they were paid by the Indians, as I mentioned earlier. This was the so-called war debt, which was added to the ledger, to the credit debit column of the ledger of India. Uh, talking of wars, let us briefly mention that uh, in, in India, as you know, contributed many soldiers to the two world wars. This is, these are the figures briefly uh, for, though they are largely forgotten in India, now there's some talk about creating monuments to these soldiers who fought during the world wars. Um, but uh, thankfully, they are remembered in Britain and even in France, where monuments have been actually erected for the Indian uh, soldiers. So, uh, uh, the Indian government here presented during the First World War a contribution of 100 million uh, pounds to UK. What is this contribution? Well, it's one more entry in that debit column of the ledger, nothing else. It is simply something that's going to be paid by Indians. And in addition to that, 8 lakh Indian troops were sent to Europe, out of which 60,000 um, were killed in fighting. During the Second World War, <coughs> two and a half million Indians fought. It was actually the largest all-volunteer force in history and it fought on almost every front uh, in Europe, Africa, Burma, Singapore, etc. And 36,000 of them lost their life. Why do I mention all this? Well, because Second World War, as we know, <coughs> we have the great figure of Winston Churchill. Uh, undoubtedly a heroic figure in his fight against uh, the Nazi um, uh, ascendancy. And it is very largely thanks to him that uh, Britain could turn the, the war against the Germans. But there is another side to Churchill, and it has to be mentioned for the sake of objectivity. And the side was that, first of all, he was extremely racist. He had utter contempt, even hatred for Indians and for uh, basically Africans and all non-white races. So uh, he uh, contributed very largely in the manner which I will describe in the next slide to the great Indian famine of 1943, in which several million Indians d died. And he knew about that, but he said that anyway, Indians were breeding like rabbits. He said the Hindus, he means Indians, uh, Hindus, Indians, these terms were synonymous in those days, are a foul race protected by their mere pullulation, that is to say propagation, from the doom that is their due not very charitable words, but this is one side of him that we need to know. And Madhushri Mukherjee <coughs> wrote a couple of years ago, I think four or five years ago, a masterly study 
called Churchill's Secret War. I would recommend this to those of you who want to know what uh, that uh, un, um, unknown or forgotten ch or unexplored chapter of the Second World War, during which she writes in uh, January 1943, although refusing to meet India's need for wheat, Churchill insisted that India continue to export rice. With famine raging in July, 19 why, why did he want uh, India to export rice? Because he had to feed the, the, the troops during the war on several fronts. The armies had to be fed. And uh, there was no better source than India to feed the, the uh, uh, European armies, especially the British one. So in July 1943, Viceroy's Go halted rice exports and asked the war cabinet for wheat and imports, this time of 500,000 tons. The news of impending shipments would indirectly ease the famine, he noted. You see, if people in India heard that uh, wheat was uh, coming to India, then of course the prices would immediately come down. Any hoarders would anticipate a fall in prices and release grain, causing prices to fall in reality. But at a meeting of August 4, the war cabinet failed to schedule even a single shipment of wheat for India. Instead, it ordered the build-up of a stockpile of wheat for feeding European civilians after they had been liberated. So uh, uh, it was uh, this which provoked this uh, 1943 very severe, um, very severe famine in India. So my conclusion. Uh, my conclusions are very simple, that this dark chapter, as uh, William Digby calls it, of uh, British rule needs to be uh, known. There's no reason to conceal it. These are facts of history. Uh, it doesn't mean that we have to demonize the British, of course, because of that, but we still have to uh, see the kind of very harsh and inhuman policies that they promoted, not only in India, but in Africa, in uh, parts of America, in China also. Uh, this, is, this is something which uh, uh, has uh, been fairly sanitized, unfortunately. Uh, secondly, <coughs> the, the big debate as to whether uh, British rule had beneficial impacts in India is a very complex one. I cannot claim to do justice to it. Uh, it is certainly a fact that the British rule pre precipitated India into uh, a, a totally new phase where India became you know, a, a very active part of the world. And uh, well, we are still, in fact, in that transition between uh, a, a traditional society and a traditional uh, a nation where even industries were traditional and even the whole economy was traditionally run to what is called modernity, good or bad, or whatever it may be. So this, of course, in this transition, the British were undoubtedly agents. Uh, whether this is for the good or for the bad, I think this is ultimately a matter of opinion. I, I don't have any myself. I just see the, the facts as they are. But I want to ask three questions <clears throat> at the end of my talk. First is, right, we have seen the British plundering India, but is the Indian plunder over? And uh, I've heard in my, all my years in India, and I've, of course, read quite a bit of those studies about the drain of India's wealth out of India uh, <clears throat> by, by uh, all those who manipulate uh, black money in particular. So this is much in the news again. And uh, nobody knows the ultimate figures, how much of Indian wealth has been drained out of India by Indians. So this is also to be considered. Is the age of famines over? We, think, we tend to think that those great famines are you know, kind of in the past and will not recur. Um, we forget that one third of the world's uh, malnourished children live in India, one third of them. And uh, some studies say, well, figures are always debatable and it depends, you know, where you peg your criteria. Some studies say that up to half of India's children are actually malnourished. Uh, that apart, <coughs> that apart, uh, it is a fact that some people, uh, especially various United Nations uh, uh, committees, are predicting uh, not only water wars, but food wars. They say there have been very alarming reports, uh, which governments usually take care not to study, 
that uh, food may actually you know disappear out of the world not disappear exactly but uh, not be able the, the, the food production will not be able to meet the growing needs and uh, they, this may become a cause for war and for means we don't know finally is the age of colonial exploitation over well that's a very big question i don't want to answer it i just want to raise it uh, is the kind of uh, economic conquest that British, the British uh, imposed, of course, through their physical presence, <clears throat> is it something that continue or can continue without an actual military conquest? This is something which, uh, uh, well, many economists have also debated. So these are the, the, the lessons that we could um, not exactly draw from uh, history, but these are the questions that this kind of uh, data we can get from the uh, period of the British Raj, uh, it could stimulate us into uh, reflecting upon such very big issues, which I think are going to come back to us in one form or another. Thank you very much. Okay.